Hello everybody and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips and I'll start with a couple of announcements as I always do. Um, the first one is we have a couple of um, of uh, boot camps coming up. People like this boot camp concept of a concentrated amount of information in a short period of time. So we do them like Friday night, Saturday afternoon. I'm going to do one in July on forming and maintaining healthy habits. This is going to be about the science of change. There is much as much a misunderstanding about what makes people convert to healthy eating patterns, healthier exercise patterns, and that sort of thing. There's as much interesting stuff to talk about as there is the effects of the diet and exercise habits that we're trying to get people to adopt themselves. And so, um, and, and the, bit, the bottom line, who this course is for, it's for the person who's saying, I know what to do, but somehow I just never end up following through and doing it. It's also for people who are trying to help people in that situation. So if you're a physician, a dietitian, a nurse, a nutritionist, a health coach, I mean, anybody who's doing something, exercise physiologist, where you're trying to get somebody to um, be able to form and maintain habits, but you seem to find a disconnect in the knowing and doing. Knowing part is easy. The doing part, not so easy. Uh, so that's the first boot camp. And then in September, I'm going to do one on autism. And this is a topic I've wanted to tackle for a long time because I see a lot of similarities to autism and cancer. Autism, uh, like cancer, you've got camps of people who have um, who are very polarized from one another. You've got the um, traditional medical camp that sometimes doesn't recognize it as a biological illness. Um, you've got people who have some pretty crazy ideas about what causes autism. And when it comes to how to help autistic children, there are a lot of ideas out there, some clearly better than others, and I think it's time to put the Wellness Farm Health filter to some of the autism information so we can help people who are dealing with this in their family. Um, when I watched the movie Vaxxed, there was a statistic that was pretty amazing, and it said that if we keep going, the trajectory right now of the increase in the incidence of autism, by the year 2050, half of all children will be autistic. Now, if that doesn't frighten us into thinking we better do something different, I don't know what possibly can. So um, those two things are coming up. Um, and we have some excellent opportunities for package deals for certification courses. So uh, if you're interested in that, let me know. The other thing that is going on is I am actively seeking affiliates who want to take advantage of this massive amount of information we have put together here. 3,500 hours of programming and 2,500 articles and stuff being added every week, and then a lot of systems and textbooks and all kinds of things. And so if you're in the healthcare business and you're kind of tired of doing this all by yourself and you'd like to have a conversation with me about it, please send me an email, pampopperatmsn.com, or if you're interested in any of the other stuff we do here, send me an email, I'll be happy to get back with you and we'll schedule a time to talk. All right, I want to talk about dementia um, this week on, on Tuesday. And I have a couple of articles. We're going to come at this from a couple of different directions. So let's start with, according to research from the FINGER trial, using several strategies, which include nutrition, exercise, and cognitive training, can reduce the risk of dementia. The study included over 1,200 people considered at risk of cognitive decline, and it was conducted over a several period, year period of time. There is still data and analysis being done on this, and there will be future reports, not just the one I'm going to give you today. The participants were randomized to either a group that received high-intensity intervention or a control group that received normal medical advice. Both groups received advice about healthy eating and the importance of physical activity, mental stimulation, social activities, and the effects of these behaviors on cognitive function. But what the participations in the intervention group got was customized dietary plans that were developed by a nutritionist, exercise sessions, both strength training and aerobic sessions under the direction of a trainer, a computer-based cognitive training program monitoring by doctors and nurses for cardiovascular risk factors, weight, and other things. And then as assessments were made and problems were identified, the intervention group got considerable attention and education on how to solve some of those problems. The diet used in this study was a combination of a plant-based Mediterranean diet and the MIND diet, which stands for Mediterranean-Intervention for Neurodegenerative Delay. That's a mouthful, isn't it? It was developed by Martha Clay Norris, a nutritional epidemiologist at Rush University Medical Center. And it basically involves eating more of the things that we know are brain-healthy foods, like leafy green vegetables, 
all vegetables, nuts, berries, beans, and whole grains, and less of the unhealthy stuff like red meat and butter and stick margarine and cheese, pastries and sweets, and fried and fast food. It has been shown in several studies to uh, retard or slow down cognitive, de cognitive decline. The diet did allow some fish, poultry, olive oil, and some wine, but it was basically a plant-based diet and significantly better than probably what most of these people would have done had there not been an intervention. The researchers reported that the intervention group was significantly better off than the control group, performing better in the areas of memory, executive function, and mental speed. One of the most interesting aspects of this trial is that persist, uh, participants who had that APOE4 gene, which predisposes people to develop Alzheimer's disease, benefited more from the intervention than people who did not have this gene, which really shows that genes are merely predisposi uh, predisposition and not uh, destiny. So um, hopefully that makes some people feel a little more empowered if you happen to be in a family where Alzheimer's disease runs in your family. Now, I found this trial interesting for a couple of reasons. Uh, the study design was a departure from the usual reductionist approach, which is where we try to find a food, a nutrient, and exercise plan. We're trying to do one thing that's going to change a disease that comes about as a result of doing a lot of things not so well. Uh, instead, the study involved multiple interventions, acknowledging that health outcomes res uh, result from many, not individual behaviors or foods. Also, the participants in the intervention group, let's think about what they were really doing. They ate well, exercised, used their brains, and were given advice about how to improve their health on a regular basis. Well, what if we just started doing that with everybody when they were 40 years old instead of waiting till they were on the verge of developing de dementia? I mean, people who do the right things at an earlier stage in life don't need intervention for dementia or anything else a lot of times. So, Last but not least, I think the even stronger effect on the people who carry the gene mutation um, is important to point out once again because so many people think that um, having coming from a bad genetic background, which I think we all do. I mean, I don't know anybody who doesn't have diseases running in their family. So we all have some genetic predisposition to be concerned about, but this clearly shows, as well as many other studies show, that um, you know, we don't have to be victims of our genetic predisposition. Now, another study that I found, or a series of studies, I think there are, in this, um, uh, in this particular one, I've got uh, 10 references for what I'm going to talk about here. According to a new meta-analysis, type 2 diabetics have an average 60% higher risk of developing dementia as compared with people who do not have diabetes. The analysis was pretty huge. It included 14 studies, over 2.3 million individuals, and over 102,000 patients with dementia. And the study concluded that there was a correlation between having diabetes and an increased risk of developing dementia. Now, this particular study didn't attempt to um, uh, develop a hypothesis about a cause and effect relationship. It was just an observational, well, an analysis of observational data showing that there was a connection. But another research group looked at the relationship between hypoglycemia and cognitive impairment or dementia in patients who were taking glucose lowering drugs. After analyzing studies that included over 1.4 million people, the researchers reported a significantly increased risk of dementia in patients who had hypoglycemic episodes and increased incidence of hypoglycemia in the patients who had dementia. Now their conclusion was, and I'm going to read this to you because it's important, our meta-analysis demonstrates a bi-directional relationship between cognitive impairment and hypoglycemia in older patients. Glucose lowering therapy should be carefully tailored and monitored in older patients who are susceptible to cognitive decline. Now, here's the fact of the matter. Diabetic patients of all ages are often over medicated and studies show that this is a dangerous practice. Patients who are aggressively treated with larger doses of medications or multiple medications in an attempt to aggressively lower their blood glucose levels to lower and lower targets um, experience more weight gain, uh, more high cholesterol, higher cholesterol and higher triglyceride levels, higher blood pressure, more heart disease, stroke, and death. In fact, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute stopped the ACCORD study because intensive treatment of diabetics increased the risk of death compared to patients who are given far less drugs. Now, many other studies have doc documented this connection between diabetes and the higher risk of dementia and the fact that medication increases the risk too. One study showed that long-term use of metformin increases the risk of Alzheimer's disease. Now, this is what's really concerning about this. 
Risk increased as both the duration and dosage of the drug increased. It's a dose-dependent effect, particularly for patients who took the drug longer than 300 days. That's less than a year. Nobody starts metformin, takes it for a year and quits, unless they end up in this office, for example, and fix themselves through diet and exercise. But most people take these drugs for years. And in doses greater than 240 milligrams. Now, the average initial dose of metformin for adult diabetics is 500 milligrams twice a day, or 850 milligrams once a day, um, and often increasing to as much as 2,550 milligrams per day. That's a significantly higher dose. The starting dose is over two times the amount that it takes to increase the risk for dementia. And once again, people don't take these drugs for short periods of time, generally speaking. Another study showed that diabetics had increased risk of dementia, particularly if they took insulin. And yet another study concluded that diabetes increases the risk of dementia, particularly vascular dementia, and the risk is even higher if the diabetic has high systolic hypertension and heart disease. Now here's the good news. Type 2 diabetes is easily treatable with diet for most people, which would eliminate the need for glucose-lowering medications and the side effects that come with them including dementia. So the bottom line is that interventions um, can keep a person at risk from developing dementia. One of the things that must be done in order for pay people to avoid developing dementia is addressing the diseases and the medications which are used for those diseases that increase the risk. All right, that's all for today. As usual, pass this on to anybody who you think might enjoy watching it, and I'll be back to you on Thursday with more news. And one last thing I forgot to mention, you guys are always writing to me and asking me for the articles and the references. They are posted in the Health Briefs Library. You can get a subscription by calling our office. That's where you find the articles and the references. All right, that is all for today, and I'll talk to you again on Thursday.